I want to say good evening to everyone. It's a joy and a delight to be with you on tonight. And I trust and pray that you've had a wonderful day and that you are feeling well and in good health right now, you and your family, because we know that that is a blessing from the Lord. And we need to learn to count our blessings as versus counting our burdens. The Bible says, bless the Lord of my soul and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord of my soul. And forget not all his benefits. So we don't need to forget the goodness and the blessings of God. We need to remember that God is a good God, not some of the time, but all the time. And as someone would say, at all the time, God is good. And I would like to say that God is better than good. He is better than better. He is the best of the best. And so we thank God for giving us another day of life health and strength. Though everything may not be right in our lives, we thank him for what is right in our lives. And we thank him for what he has done and is doing for us every day of our lives. And so if you are visiting with us tonight, we welcome you. We thank you for tuning in to this telecast. And we pray that something will be said during this broadcast that will enable you to get a little closer to the Lord. I want to encourage you now to bow for a word of prayer as we go to God in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so very much for this another day of life, 
health, and strength. We thank you, Lord, for blessing us to be able to be on this side of life. And for whatever health and strength we have, we thank you for that. For we know, Lord, that there are those who would give anything to have the level of health that some of us currently enjoy. And so, Lord, may we never take those blessings for granted. We thank you for the food, the clothing, and the shelter, and the transportation, the funds, everything that you've given unto us to sustain our lives and not only sustain our lives, but to enjoy life as well. Father, we thank you for keeping us safe during the COVID crises. And Lord, we ask you to continue to bless this nation, yea, bless this world, as we gradually come out of this pandemic. We pray, Lord, that you would enable us to get completely out from under this burden, this fear, this, this scourge that's called COVID-19. It has taken many lives and we pray for those who have been touched by its cold and deadly hand. We pray for those families to be healed of their hurt and their pain. And Father, we pray for all of those who are struggling. We pray for those who are struggling with life, struggling with their children, struggling with their health, struggling with their marriage, struggling with themselves, their inner struggle with their own battles, their father, their own sins, their own weaknesses. We pray for those, their father, who may have a spirit of hopelessness. We pray, God, that they would never give up on life, but especially never give up on you, knowing that you are able, their father, to do exceed and abundantly above all that we ask or think, and that you can and that you will bring them through whatever they are encountering or strengthening them in the valley so that they can endure the valley. Lord, we ask you to be with this nation as we continue to struggle. We continue to struggle with division. Dear Father, very sharp division in our nation, politically speaking. As we see, Lord, and just all kinds of stuff that are still circulating, things that are still circulating, Lord. And we just want you, dear Father, to be with this nation and bless us to overcome. Because we know that the Bible tells us, your word tells us that righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. And if the foundation be destroyed, where shall the righteous run? So Lord, we cannot afford to have the foundation of this nation destroyed and the foundation of what makes for a healthy society to be destroyed. Lord, if we can't know truth and can't stand on truth and people can't acknowledge truth, then Lord, this country will not survive. And so, Lord, I pray that our politicians will decide to put country before politics and to put, put the cross before their allegiance, put the cross of Christ and allegiance to you before they would commit allegiance to a party or to an individual or to individuals. Lord, we just ask you to be with us and help us to always look to you. For we know that our hope is in you and not in this world, that our hope is in you and not in political figures. Our hope is in you and not in political parties. So Lord, help us never to get that confused. Help us never to forget the source of our help, the source of our hope, and the source of our strength. And the source of our greatness is you, Lord. 
and not anything or anyone else. Forgive us all of our sins, whether they be in word, thought, or in deed, by omission or commission, or even by disposition. Be with us now as we study together tonight your blessed word. We pray that it will touch someone and that someone would decide to obey your word. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I want to say to the congregation that we are going to, you should have already received the message sharing with you where we will be worshiping beginning the first Sunday in the month of June, June 6th, we will be worshiping at the Austin Prep School, a college prep school directly across the street from our church building. It's located at 5800 MLK Street and we want to encourage you, you know the place, all you have to do is just stand in our parking lot and look directly across MLK and you will see Austin College Prep School. Uh, we will be worshiping there until the Lord enables us to get back in our facilities. And so starting on June the 6th, 2021, if the Lord says the same, we will be meeting at that location at our regular time at 10 a.m. on Sunday morning. We will not have Sunday evening worship until we return to our facility. And the Wednesday night Bible classes or all of the Bible classes will remain online. So we look forward to seeing you face to face on June the 6th, if the Lord should say the same, directly across the street from where we are located right now at the Austin College Prep School. We encourage you to please plan to be with us as we come together after many, many months of being apart and we look forward to seeing each and every one of you. You do have and should have received a message from the leadership explaining to you exactly how we plan to do that. And it's, in essence, we're still going to try to stay within the guidelines of being concerned about the spread of the virus. Many of us have already gotten our vaccines. We've been vaccinated. And we want to encourage you, uh, if you should so desire, please uh, think about it, pray about it, and we pray that you will choose to get the vaccination. Uh, all of the leaders have received it, and thank God none of us have had any kind of negative repercussions. And so we encourage you to do likewise. We want to be able to come together. We want to be able to take these masks off, and we want to be able to embrace one another, hug one another, and we want to be able to shake hands. We want to be able to return to our normal, and we look forward to doing that. So we look forward to seeing you on June the 6th. If you have any questions, get in touch with us at the Church of Christ at Eastside. Get in touch with any of the leaders, any of us in leadership, and we will respond to whatever your questions might be. Now tonight, we're going to ask you to go ahead and and open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21, and we're going to be looking at this chapter tonight. I'm gonna to read the whole chapter tonight as we just together study this. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 21, beginning at verse number one, now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying, there shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. 
I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, all liars, listen, all liars, all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bows filled with the seven last plagues came to me and talked with me saying, come, I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, a clear, clear as crystal. Also, she had a great and high wall with 12 gates and 12 angels at the gates. And names were written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. Three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, and three gates on the west. Now the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And he talked with me, and he who talked with me had to go read to measure the city, its gates and its wall. The city is laid out as a square. Its length is as great as its breadth. And he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs. Its length, breadth, and height are equal. Then he measured its wall, 144 cubits, according to the measure of a man, that is, of an angel. The construction of its wall was of jasper. The city was pure gold, like clear glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with all kinds of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper the second sapphire, and the third chalcedony, the fourth emerald, the fifth sardonyx, 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 the sixth sardius, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysoprase, the eleventh jan jan jacinth, and the twelfth amethyst. The twelve gates were twelve pearls, each individual gate was of one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. But I saw no temple in it, <clears throat> for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city had no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light, and all the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light. And the kings of the earth will bring their glory and honor into it. Its gates shall not be shut at all by day. There shall be no night there. there. And they shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. But there shall by no means enter it anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. What a powerful, powerful passage. So we want to try to finish chapter 21 on tonight. We're going to Kind of get us through that. If the Lord says the same, we'll be able to do that. So I trust that you'll just stay with me as we go through this text on tonight. Now, we're going to start by looking at what is stated here in Revelation chapter 21. I need to share with you my screen so that we can be together on this. Revelation chapter 21 
and I need to share with you my screen if I can just get that screen to come up. Just bear with me if you will. Revelation chapter 21, and we're going to get it to come up here shortly. All right, I had closed it out. I apologize for that, but I'm going to get it back if you just give me a chance to. All right, we're looking at Revelation chapter 21. Here we go. I need to share my screen with you. We're gonna go down here to slide 84, 80. Let's start here. All right. Last week we finished with verse number eight. And verse number eight basically says, um, all righty. I'm going to get it together here in a moment. I can't start over time. Won't permit me to do that. So uh, the Bible says in Revelation chapter 21 in verse number eight, that all liars, all liars shall have their part in that lake that burns with fire and brimstone. We talked about that at length last week. And we shared with you the fact that Christians are supposed to speak truth and not error. Uh, we are supposed to be supporters of the truth and not error. I don't care who it is that tells the lie, Christians are supposed to stand for the truth, even, even if you would like what is being said to be the truth. If it is not the truth, we are duty-bound as children of God to speak truth. Now, in verse number nine, the Bible says, and this is Revelation chapter 21, verses nine and 10, the Bible says, then, one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues came to me and talked with me saying, come, I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem descending out of heaven from God. Now remember from reading verses two and four, that the church, two through four, that the church glorified in heaven, that's what we're looking at, and the heavenly city are so interconnected with one another that they are spoken of as though they are one and the same. So we see the church glorified in eternity, but also in that image is the image of the eternal city of God, which is heaven itself. Uh, just as a bride and her groom become one, so it is with the church and the city eternally prepared for us. We are forever one. There is no distinction. We will never be separated from that city and we will never leave that city. We are with God and God is with us. That's what we have to understand. We are with God and God is with us. Revelation chapter 21 verses 9 and 10. Come, the angel said, I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. This is the same language that is used in Revelation chapter 21 and verse number two, where the Bible says, then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride of dawn for her husband. The New Jerusalem is the church, according to Revelation chapter 21 and verse number two, and we looked at verses nine and 10 just now. So when you talk about the New Jerusalem, it is the church of Christ. The Bible teaches emphatically that the New Jerusalem is the church of Christ. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 18 through 24. I'm not gonna read all of that, but that's where the text begins, but I'm just going to read verses 22 through 23a for the sake of time. The Bible says in Hebrews 12, 22 through 23a, to prove that the church is indeed the new Jerusalem. He says, but you have come to Mount Zion as versus Mount Sinai, to the heavenly Jerusalem, 
to the city of the living God, you have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. The author of the book of Hebrews makes no bones about it in stating that the city that we've come to, this heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God is indeed the church of the firstborn and the firstborn has reference to Jesus Christ. And so the church is that new Jerusalem. That's why uh, the author, John in Revelation chapter 21 describes her as the bride of Christ adorned for her husband. The New Testament clearly established establishes that the church is the bride of Christ. Second Corinthians chapter 11, verses one through three, Ephesians chapter five, verses 22 through 33. Those verses emphatically teach that the bride of Christ is the church of Christ and the church of Christ is the bride of Christ. Verse number 10, the Bible says, and he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. John is about to give us a vision of the new, the new Jerusalem, the church, the bride of Christ glorified in heaven. But remember what I've already said, that the church in its glorified state is also a description of the eternal heavenly city. John mixes them together so that we see the heavenly city at the same time that we see the glorified church. According to verse number 10, this great city is holy and it is from God. Both statements are true of the church and the heavenly city. The church is holy. God has separated the church from the world, set it apart. That is the idea of sanctification and holiness, being separated from the defilement and filth of this world. And it is from God. The church has come from God. Without Christ, there could be no church. Acts 20 and 28, says he purchased it with his own blood. Ephesians 5, 22 and following, he died for the church. And in Matthew 16 and verse number 18, Jesus said upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. There would be no church were it not for God, Christ and the Holy Spirit. And Christ, of course, paid the ultimate price in that he took upon himself our human flesh and went to Calvary and died for our sins and his blood purchased the church. We are the church, not to build it. And just like right now, we are out of our church building, which is where the church meets. But the church is the people and not the facility. And that's why wherever we worship, we can worship in the parking lot, we can worship in a gymnasium, we can worship in the school across the street. Wherever we worship, we are the church of Christ worshiping God. And so it's not about location, it's about what you do and who you are in that location. And so the church is set apart by God for his purpose and it is from God. So it is with the city to whom, uh, to which we are going, it is holy. Nothing defiled will ever come into that city as we shall see, and it is from God. Now, when we come to verses 11 through 21, we get a description of the external of the holy city. Now we're able to see externally what that city looks like. John describes the city, and these are just some images to try to give you some idea. He talks about how the city is a cube and he talks about the 12 foundations and 
the 12 gates or portals into the city. And so he talks about this high mountain being taken to the high mountain where he could see this holy city coming down out of heaven. So in essence, its origin is from heaven. So John gives us a beautiful description of the externals of this city. Listen to what he says in Revelation chapter 21, beginning at verse number 11, having the glory of God, for light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Also, she had a great and high wall with 12 gates and 12 angels at the gates and names were written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. Three gates on the east and three gates on the north and three gates on the south and three gates on the west. Now the wall of the city had 12 foundations and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the lamb. And he who talked with me had a gold reed to measure the city, its gates and its wall. The city is laid out as a square. Its length is as great as its breadth. And he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs. Its length, breadth and height are equal. Then he measured its wall, 144 cubits, according to the measure of a man that is of an angel. The construction of its wall was of jasper and the city was pure gold like clear glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with all kinds of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardius, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysophrase, the eleventh jacinth, and the twelfth amethyst. The twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each individual gate was of one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. Lord have mercy, what a city. Verse number 11, the Bible talks about having the glory of God. Her light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. What is he trying to tell us? John is beginning to describe this glorious church slash city. He says, it has the glory of God. A.T. Roberts' words of the New Testament states it in this way, the radiance of the dazzling splendor of God. In essence, human language really cannot explain the beauty and the dazzling radiance of this city. God's glory filled the tabernacle and the temple in the Old Testament. According to Exodus 40, verse 34, and 1 Kings chapter 8, and verse number 11. Exodus 40, verses 34 and 35. The Bible says, then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, tent of meeting. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. That's God's Shekinah glory. Moses could not enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled upon it and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. And so we're talking about God's Shekinah glory, a representation of God's glory. But ultimately, as Solomon said, the heavens of the heavens cannot hold God. God is so awesome and so great and so big that the Bible says he has to stoop to look upon the heavens. And 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 10 and 11, when the priest withdrew from the holy place, the cloud filled the temple of the Lord. Same concept that is in Exodus chapter 40, verse number 11. And the priest could not perform their service because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled his temple. 
Revelation chapter 21 and verse number 11 is a way of speaking of God himself when the Bible talks about the glory of God. So in verse number 11, it's not just talking about the glory of God, but it's talking about God himself, not a representation of him, but God himself. Revelation chapter 21 in verse number three. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. Watch this. And he will dwell with them and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. Hallelujah. What a beautiful picture. Don't you know that we're going to be with God and God will be with us. We won't have to wonder what God is like. We won't have to look at him through the lens of scripture, which can only give us big use, metaphors, images, trying to help us to understand the glory of this awesome God. No, sir, and no, ma'am, we will be in heaven itself, the very home of God. We will be with him and he will be with us. We will be in our glorified bodies so we don't have to worry about being destroyed. You remember when Moses said, God, show me your glory. And God says, no man can see me and live. You can't stand my glory. I'll destroy you. My glory is too brilliant for you, Moses. But he said, I will hide you in the cliff of the rock. And as I pass by, I will put my hand over you and you will see that as I pass by, I will move my hand and you will see the hinder part of my glory. And that's just an anthropomorphism given of human-like characteristics to God. God does not have hands like us. God does not have a back like us. That's communicating in human language to let us know that God is trying to let us know that we cannot stand to be in his presence in our current condition. That's why we need glorified bodies that will be indestructible and incorruptible. And that's what Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So we will be with God. God will be with us. When he talks about the glory of God, he's talking about the brilliance of God, the dazzling brilliance and brightness of God. John describes it in this way. In 1 John chapter 1 and verse number 5, this is the message we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. None. Pure light. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 16, who alone has immortality, dwelling in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to whom be honor and everlasting power. Amen. Revelation chapter 22 and verse number five. There shall be no night there. They need no lamp nor a light of the sun for the Lord God gives them light and they shall reign forever and ever. So when the Bible talks about the glory of God being in that city, it's talking about the very presence of God, the essence of God. God will be there and we will be with God. That's why we live for God now. And that's why we don't quit when life gets tough because we know what's in store for us. Friends, listen to me. If I didn't have this hope in me, Life would discourage me just like it discourages all of us. And it would be easy to give up. But I thank God for this glorious hope. And what the Bible is trying to get us to see, if we just remain faithful till the end, one day, all that we're going through now will be a non-issue. We will never think about it anymore. It will not be a bother 
because we will forever and ever and ever and ever be with God. And everything that could have caused us sadness and did cause us sadness will never cause us any sadness ever again. That's why we remain faithful even until death. No matter what we are confronted with, no matter what we are dealing with, no matter the disappointments, no matter the frustrations, no matter the betrayals, no matter the hurt and the pain, we remain faithful because we understand that what we are dealing with now is just a bleep on the radar of eternity. And God says, I will be with you and you will be with me and never again will we suffer. What a beautiful thought. The brilliance of God's presence will be indescribable. There are no words that can describe a light that will be more brilliant than the noonday sun. We can't even look at the sun right now. Just imagine a light that dwarfs the sun. It makes the sun seem like nothing. God's brilliance, God himself is so brilliant that everything that we know in this world fades into oblivion in comparison to God. I, I was trying to find some pictures, just trying to you know, illustrate this, but of course there are no pictures that can illustrate that reality. But I just want you to kind of put your mind there if you can, just try to imagine a light that's so brilliant that it's almost unbearable. In fact, it would be unbearable were you not in your glorified state. God is this brilliant light that will be in the midst of us. Verses 12 and 13. Also, she had a great and high, we're talking about the city, had a great and high wall with 12 gates and 12 angels at the gates and names were written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel, three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south and three gates on the west. In ancient cities, you know, as well as I know, walls and gates were used as a source of protection from assault and from attacks from other neighboring enemy cities. However, there will be no enemies because all of the enemies have been destroyed by God. So why would he talk about walls and gates on this city or portals on this city where there is no threat from outward sources of any kind to ever attack this city. What is the message? The message is that there is absolutely nothing or anyone that can ever, 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 ever destroy or interrupt the fellowship between God and his people. The relationship between God and his people is eternally secure. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. Isn't that wonderful? That's the message of the walls. That's the message of it. We don't have to worry about anybody attacking, but in their minds, they understood that meant safety, security, protection. And so God is saying, when we make it to that eternal city, you will never fear anything else or anyone else forever. Prove that it is merely an image of safety and protection. Right here in Revelation chapter 21, verse 25, the Bible says specifically, its gates shall not be shut at all by day. There shall be no night there. And so he tells us that the gates will never be shut. So what he's trying to do is give us an image of security. But now he's telling us there'll never be any threats from our external sources anyway. 
and there will be no nights. That's when the gates were closed. In every ancient city at night, the gates were closed. In the daytime, they were open if there was no threat from an enemy at the time. But there will never be an occasion where there will ever be a need for the gates to ever be shut. Nehemiah chapter 13, verse number 19 bears this fact out that that's what they did. The Bible says, when evening shadows fell on the gates of Jerusalem before the Sabbath, Nehemiah said, I ordered the doors to be shut and not opened until the Sabbath was over. I stationed some of my own men at the gates so that no load could be brought in on the Sabbath day. So the gates were shut whenever the Sabbath came, of course, and of course, when the night would fall, the gates were closed. And if there were enemies that they were concerned about, the gates were also closed, whether it's day or night. And then the rest of chapter 11, verse, chapter 21, verses 11 through 21. I've already read all of these verses. I won't reread them for the sake of time, but we've already read them. But in verses 14 through 21, what is being said here? The point of verses 14 through 21 is to show the magnitude, the splendor, the beauty, and the absolute grandness of that city. That's what that's all about. The 12 tribes of Israel in verse number 12 and the 12 apostles in verse number 14 represent the saved from both covenants, the old covenant as well as the new covenant. Then he talks about the measurements of the city. He talks about the city is represented as a cube. He describes it as a cube. And when you measure that, when, he, when you take the measurements that he gave, that's a city that's 1,500 miles wide, 1,500 miles tall, and 1,500 miles in width. You're talking about a humongous city that staggers the mind. It is and the perfect cube, which is but to say it is the absolute epitome of perfection. And of course, when you go back and you look at the Old Testament, look at both the tabernacle and the temple, it was also, both of those were also cubes. The holiest of holies uh, was also a cube in the tabernacle and a cube in the temple. So even in that, we were seeing a reflection of heaven itself where God's presence was in that tabernacle by his glory and in the temple that Solomon built by his glory, which was a foreshadowing of the reality that God's presence is forever in heaven. And of course, we know he's with us. I'm not talking about his ubiquitous nature or his omnipresent nature, which would be more accurate because he doesn't just seem to be everywhere. He is everywhere at the same time. And so I want you to understand that all of that was merely a foreshadowing of God's glorious heaven. And God is indeed with his people. The thickness of the wall is 72 yards thick. Lord have mercy. That's what he's talking about. When he says in verse number 16, the city is laid out as a square. Its length is as great as its breadth. And he measured the height uh, and he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs. Its length, its breadth, and its height are equal. Then he measured its wall, 144 cubits, according to the measure of a man that is of an angel. So what is he saying? So here we see the measurements of the city, 1,500 miles wide, tall, and width. And then, of course, the thickness of the wall, 72 yards thick. Nothing is going to get into that city. Lord have mercy. Now, in verses 22 through 27, but I saw no temple in it. For the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. Again, there need to be no representation of a place to worship God because God is the ultimate object of our worship. The city had no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it. The glory for the glory for the glory of God illuminated it. The lamb is its light. And the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light. And the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into it. 
its gate shall not be shut at all by day. There shall be no night there, and they shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. All of the honor and the glory that this world ever, ever had will be in that city. God will have it all. It all belongs to him. Everything that God has given to this world that brings honor and glory to him will now be in that city. Everyone who brings glory to God will now be in that city. In verse 27, the Bible says, but there shall be by no means enter it anything, anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those written in the Lamb's book of life. The message is the same. What is it? God and Christ are the main focus of the city and the main focus of our worship. The need for the old order of things will not be known in that world. The things that we once knew will no longer be known in that world. There will be no longer any need for any kind of protection from anything that can defile. There will be nothing to ever defile that city. The end. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the city to which we are headed. It is a glorious city. God himself is in that city. But you notice how the chapter ends. Verse 27 of chapter 21 ends with no one whose name is not written in the Lamb's book of life will be in that city. Only those whose name is in the Lamb's book of life will be in that city. You need to get your name written in the book. You need to be in the Lamb's book of life. How do you get into that book of life? You, you do it by believing that Jesus Christ came, suffered, bled, and died for your sins. John 8, 21 and 24, Jesus said, except you believe that I am he. And the, the original language, I am. I am that I am. Going back to Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, the claim of deity. He says, except you believe that I am. He says, you shall die in your sins. And if you die in your sins, where I am, you cannot come. So you need to deal with your sins. And the only one that can adequately deal with your sins is God himself. You must believe, you must believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God, crucified, buried, and resurrected. You must believe that truth. And you must be willing to repent of your sins. Luke 13, 3 and 4, Acts 17, 30 and 31, Acts 3, 19. If you don't repent, you will perish. That's what the Bible teaches. And so friends, I would encourage you to repent. That simply means to have a change of mind that leads to a change of life, that leads to a change of action. So you need to repent, turn away from your sins, turn to the Lord and say, Lord, I'm ready to live for you now then confess the name of Jesus Christ. Romans 10, 9 and 10, for with the heart man believes unto righteousness, unto salvation, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. But ladies and gentlemen, we need to be more than unto, we need to be into. And so all of these things, believing that Christ died for your sins, was buried and rose again, repented of your sins, confessing the name of Christ, leads you closer to. And the culmination, the culmination is your obedience in baptism. No, no, no. Christ is Savior. Don't let anybody tell you that we teach anything other than the fact that Christ is Savior. But Jesus said in Mark 16, 15 and 16, go into all of the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He who believes not shall be condemned. Jesus put water in the plan. We didn't. Jesus put it in the plan. That's why on the day of Pentecost, when the question was asked, men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter replied in Acts 2 and verse number 38, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So God put it in the plan. Acts 22:16. 16. And now why are you tarrying? That's what Ananias said unto Saul. 
Arise and be baptized, wash it away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Friends, just do what God says do. And if you just do what God says do, he will save you by his grace. You can't earn it, you can't work for it. It's the gift of God. And when you do what God says, you say, well, when you do it, Brother Williams, it sounds like to me you're telling me you have to do something. Yes, you do. You have to believe that's doing something. Except you believe, you must repent, that's doing something. You must confess, that's doing something. You must be baptized. But you are not earning salvation. You are simply in faith responding to the word of God, trusting him, not you nor your acts, but trusting him by his grace to save you. And when he does, he will add you to his glorious body, the church that Jesus died for, his church, the body of Christ, the church of Christ. Won't you do that tonight? You can call us, you can get in touch with us and we will, well, call, not call us, but, but, but email us and we'll get in touch with you. And we will do what we can to help you in your obedience to Christ. The next time we come back, we will look at the last chapter of the book of Revelation. God bless you. Have a wonderful evening.